Hey what's up everybody, it is Kellen here from Start Your Systems and welcome back to Monster Energy Supercross 3, the official video game where today we're going to be playing my custom rendition of the 2020 Salt Lake City 4 Supercross uh, that I made with Track Editor and talking about the 2020 Salt Lake City 4 Supercross that just happened on Wednesday evening. This is Thursday morning or whenever this is that you guys are watching this recap video. And as mo most of you guys know, this is essentially where I will basically just be doing a little bit of a podcast where I'll kind of take you through some of my thoughts and opinions from everything that happened at round four in Salt Lake City or round 14 of the 2020 Monster Energy AMA Supercross Championship in both classes. So spoiler alert, if you haven't already watched the races, I'm going to be talking about them. And uh, yeah, we'll jump into it. First of all, though, I wanted to, again, give a shout out to Pay2021 for these uh, PC mods that he has for the game. I'll be sure to try to link him in the description below or just link you to his page so you can check him out for yourself. Pretty easy to get him in game once you uh, install the link and uh, only available on PC. I know people always ask, can I get him on console? Nope, PC only. So apologies for that, but uh, always kind of some cool stuff that you can run and just feel a little bit more official in the game sometimes uh so yeah anyway let's talk about salt lake city 4 450 main event spoiler alert as mentioned cooper webb picking up his 10th career supercross victory his third win of 2020 and his second consecutive wednesday night supercross victory there's only been two wednesday night supercrosses ever and cooper webb has won both of them although it really wasn't like a night supercross is an evening slash day supercross um but yeah, essentially, I think this one comes down to good starts a little bit, and people are always like ragging on to or Web can't beat Tomac without a good start, and this you know doesn't really help disprove that. But I will just counter that on Sunday he ran toe to toe with Tomac the entire main event, and he was pretty clearly in control of the main event. I would say this week, um, like it just seemed like Roxon gave him a couple. You know, shot him a wheel a couple times early in the main, and uh, even, I think, got ahead of him at one point, but it was pretty quick that Webb kind of, like, turned it back up and went right back around him, and he was almost kind of, like, looked like he was just perfectly comfortable to run that pace, and if he needed to wick it up, he could. So, it seemed like from the get-go, it was going to be, like, a Webb kind of handling the race from the front kind of race, because Roxon's still dealing with the breathing issues, and he's just clearly not the same guy I would say and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about a couple weeks ago or a couple rounds ago not weeks because it was last week but a couple rounds ago where fitness is just playing such a huge part in this at this point and I mean if you don't think that's true I will counter with the fact that Ken Roxon was all over Cooper Webb for 10 laps in a heat race and he was all over Cooper Webb for 10 laps in a main event and they were clearly similar pace if not you know Roxon a little bit better at some stages and then Roxon just falls off a cliff. And I, it, I mean, it's obviously breathing issue related. Other people are having just straight up fitness issues from the time off and getting back to altitude and all this stuff like that. So that's what I was kind of talking about when it's, you know, fitness related is that, you know, this, it would have been a great battle like the Tomac Webb one that we saw on Sunday night between Roxon and Webb had Roxon had the distance in him, but he doesn't. And he really hasn't for years since the crash, but Sometimes he does, and it's just a bummer to not see it happening now. Uh, that being said, as soon as he started falling, it was pretty drastic, I would say. It wasn't as drastic as it was on Sunday where he dropped two laps down and finished 10th. But he went from right on web to getting passed by Baggett like two laps later to getting passed by uh, Osborne to getting passed by Tomac eventually. And he was able to settle in and come home fifth, but still, it's kind of a bummer that uh you know it's kind of come to this at this point for kenny and uh now he is not second in the championship it took four rounds to basically switch over and have webb now ahead of him when it wasn't even close webb was 26 points behind tomac so he was 23 points behind uh ken roxon coming into this swing and uh now cooper webb is ahead of him in the championship he's only two points ahead of him i think uh, but he's 27 back of Tomac, so it's very unlikely anything goes uh, the way against Tomac at this point. But that just goes to show you it took four rounds of Roxon having just kind of atrocious 
racing is basically for Webb to slash away the points on him. At this point, you know, it's not going to take it's not going to take the three rounds to slash away the points lead to Tomac. So, still sticking to my guns, Tomac is going to probably win this title with ease down the stretch. But it's just fun to see that there is still battling going on in this 450 class. Cooper Webb is feisty. Zach Osborne is looking great. Blake Baggett finally looked like normal Blake Baggett. He's talked about numbness in his hands being a problem and not being able to hold on. Uh, so that part is kind of. You know, obviously frustrating from his standpoint, but he was fastest qualifier. He ran third pretty much the entire main event, uh, but then got you know got caught late. Uh, he was initially passed by Osborne, and then Tomac came up and passed him, and then Roxon was going backwards, so Baggett passed him back, and then he got up to fourth again, so he finished fourth, and uh, just killed my fantasy team in the process. But I digress. It really looked great. And finally, that's the bag that we've kind of all been waiting for because he clearly has the speed to run up front. Just doesn't seem like he has the hands, I guess, to run up front right now. But let's talk about Eli Tomac because Eli Tomac has had three very, very different starts to his main events the last three rounds. So if you uh, follow me on racetracksonline.com, I'm the online content editor over there. And I do a series on Racetracks Illustrated's YouTube channel called Race Examination. And I talked about at Salt Lake City 2, which was two rounds ago now, how Eli Tomac and Ken Roxon both got pinched off on the start pretty badly last Wednesday by Cooper Webb, who was uh, to the outside of Tomac and three gates to the outside of Roxon. And he got the jump on both of them and basically just slammed the door going into the first corner. He got a great start. They both got pretty bad starts. And... Tomac on Sunday chose the, I believe, fourth from the inside gate, and he talked in the post-race press conference after he won on Sunday about how going into that main event start, he was pretty nervous because he was kind of feeling like he was going to have a same problem on that inside gate that he had on Wednesday when Cooper Webb kind of shut everything off there. And then we come into this round, and I was kind of interested to see that Tomac again you know, he didn't have, uh, he didn't win his heat race or anything like that, but he again chose, did he win his heat? Maybe he did. Am I just an idiot right now? I'm just blanking on what just happened. Anyway, he wasn't so far down the order that he couldn't pick his gate. Uh, he, you know, he very clearly could have picked probably closer to the box if he wanted to, but he chose four or five from the inside. I forget which, but it was still pretty far inside comparatively. And he got pinched bad off the start he got kind of out jumped by osborne barsha swarmed in and before you know it he was very very last coming into the inside of the first turn but then he kind of snuck around on the inside of everybody and came out i think he came across the line the first lap 14th or so uh across the flag and i'm just curious a little bit on the thought process there uh, clearly he has the speed to run through the field. There's no doubt about that. But in the post-race press conference tonight, he actually talked about how he's got to get these starts like figured out. And he's been kind of mad at himself about the starts a little bit because he doesn't want to put himself in this situation, like especially with Cooper Webb and Ken Roxon up front. And he even said that he, he noticed both of them up front early in the race and kind of kind of freaked out a little bit was kind of like oh no I can't lose too many points to those guys but he's been much better this year about like settling and not going full panic mode where he rides over his head and crashes or does something silly so really good measured ride to get all the way back up to the podium but uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see where his gate pick is going to be uh, this coming Sunday which is going to be round five in Salt Lake City because like you would think that the lessons learned from the second Salt Lake City round getting pinched off and then being nervous about his gate pick at Salt Lake City 3 meant that he would choose a different gate more in the middle of the gate. So at the very least, if he um, you know, kind of got out jumped a little bit or whatever, he was in a group of people that were going into the corner first, which tends to be Roxon, Webb, um, Osborne, all these guys that start kind of more in the middle of the gate. If he's in those, you know, with those guys, I don't think he comes out any worse than like 10th just because he'll kind of funnel in with them through the first turn and everything like that. I don't know. You know, there's so much more thought process to the start and everything like that. And I'm not saying Tomac's terrible picking gates. I'm not trying to say that at all. Uh, but like I said, I'm just really curious to see what his gate selection will be on Sunday to see if he's uh, changed that mentality out at all because it clearly did put him at a huge disadvantage off the start. He had no chance basically to catch those guys and, uh, 
just kind of methodically picked people off and eventually got up to third. So really good measured ride, salvaged a lot of good points, obviously. Still beat Ken Roxon, who was second in the championship entering. Now it's, you know, Cooper Webb that he's going to have to start kind of dealing with and worrying about, if that's what we want to call it, because he's oh, so far back, I don't think it's really worrying at this point. But, uh, yeah, still a good ride, and well done to him. want to give uh, kudos to Zach Osborne, who has had basically the you know best week and a half of his 450 career so far um obviously he f he's finished second in a main event before so this isn't a career best or anything like that but i think he is riding at his best in on a 450 so far because again i think webb was riding pretty well measured at the front and could control things from there but you know osborne he got into second he passed baggett he passed roxon and he like pretty actively was catching Webb for most of the second half of the race. It was tenths of a second, so it wasn't a lot. But he was clearly running the pace and keeping, uh, you know, close eye on Cooper. I think he crossed the line about four, three, four seconds down at most. Um, so I'm really curious to see if Osborne can get another star like he had <clears throat> the first Wednesday, which was Salt Lake City two. And Webb maybe doesn't get a good start, or Tomac starts further back, or something like that. Like, how cool to be down the stretch if Osborne could win one of these races? Like, it's always fun to see a first-time winner. Osborne seems like he's got the ball rolling right now, and he's getting good starts, so there's always, like, that good combo that's going on with him. Um, yeah, I, I really, I don't, I would not put it out of the question to see Osborne win one of these things before this is over. He's probably the only guy I would say that about. Maybe Anderson. I don't think Baggett's going to win a race um, unless Ken Roxon fixes his breathing issues immediately i'm not picking him for a win down the stretch uh it's probably going to between be between tomac and webb for these last three but i'd still like to see osborne get in there and, and get a win that'd be really dang cool and shout out marty party martin davalos is freaking good guys <laughs> like he's got on a 450 and this salt lake city stretch he has been very very good and i actually wrote about him in our 10 things article on racer x and i was talking about how um, if he could just gain nine more points on Baggett, he would be the second best KTM rider on the season. Like that's how good his season has been too. Like he's not just had these couple good races. He's actually put in some pretty solid rides. Remember he's on the podium until the very last couple corners in Atlanta earlier this year. So clearly he has been uh, hovering near the front, but, uh, you know, Baggett obviously beat him this week, but only gained a couple points on him. And Davalos has been getting good starts. He looks terrific in the whoops. Uh, he is basically just been super steady these last uh, four rounds of Supercross so far. And uh, curious to see if he continues the upward trend. We obviously saw Malcolm, who was uh, pretty consistently working his way into and eventually finished top five. He had a bike issue. I'm not sure what it was at this point. I uh, haven't heard an official update, but he seemed obviously pretty pissed off and rode off the track by himself. So seemed like it was uh, something mechanical and not uh, physically uh, impairing him in any way. So that was kind of a bummer to see. And then Justin Barsha had a huge one. No idea. I haven't seen footage of it yet either, but completely broke his front wheel. Looked like he broke like half at least of the spokes on his front wheel. And I heard a report... I'm not going to say this is accurate. I'm just saying this is a report I heard. It's a complete rumor that he actually broke his front wheel landing in a rhythm section and then it sent him off the track and that's how he ended up in the you know, the barriers outside of the uh, outside of the track. No idea if that's true. Still haven't seen video. Really no, don't want to say anything is official until I see video of it because I have no idea how he ended up where he did and how his bike ended up as mangled as it was. Like the bars were bent, the forks were shifted, the front tire was destroyed. It was, man, it looked like a big one, whatever it was. So, And he kind of limped off. Haven't heard uh, if he's good or not, but definitely kind of falling apart here a little bit. And I think he actually now officially has fallen behind Anderson for fourth in the championship. So definitely not a couple weeks in Salt Lake City. Justin Barsha is hoping to have who, um, I believe if he finished top three in the championship, uh, locked in a guaranteed option on his deal at Yamaha so we're hearing Plessinger is already re-signed at Yamaha and uh, obviously Ferrandis is definitely going to need to move up next year so you know fingers are all pointed that he'll go to Yamaha I personally believe he ends up at KTM on a third bike and then he will move to the official second role at KTM 
after Marvin retires, but uh, I, you know, that's just my thoughts. I have no idea if that's accurate or not. That's just what I kind of seeing the way things are developing. But uh, you know, a lot of people say he might end up at Yamaha. Justin Barsha's contract is up. His guaranteed lock-in, if he finished third in the championship, seems to not be happening because he's faltering kind of bad here down the stretch. So maybe this does open the door for Brandis moving to Yamaha alongside AP next season. And then, you know, where's that lead Barsha? Does he go to Rocky Mountain KTM or Rocky Mountain Gas Gas as it's maybe going to be? Or does he go back to JGR, which he didn't gel with on the Suzuki? Or, you know, what happens there? Maybe he actually officially retires. Keeps talking about having unfinished business in the USA and he just won a race this year, so it seems ridiculous that he retire. Um, but he's always been had a love-hate relationship with GPs. Maybe he goes there. I don't know. Silly season is going to be ridiculous. I'll have a whole video on that separately another day. But anyway, just wanted to bring up a couple talking points there. Uh, regarding 450s and seats and musical chairs and stuff like that. Let's talk about 250s though because the West did just come back so we have to kind of refresh everything and then talk about this race as well. Of course coming in, Ferrandez had uh, a 7 point lead on Justin Cooper. I believe he had a 12 point lead on Austin Forkner, a 13 point lead somewhere in that range. And uh, Forkner won the main event so Forkner clawed that thing back down to 10 so it must have been 13 because Ferrandez finished 2nd. Justin Cooper looked not very Justin Cooper-y most of the day. Didn't seem as feisty. And uh, he also started in front of McAdoo, <clears throat> excuse me, and Ferrandis in the main event. And both of those guys passed him. Ferrandis I could kind of get because Ferrandis has, in my opinion, been the best 250 rider this season. But uh, it was kind of shocking to see uh, McAdoo pass Cooper, especially because it really did seem like Forkner, Ferrandis, and Cooper were the guys in this class, and McAdoo just fully inserted himself in there as a, as a main talking point uh, down the stretch here by getting on the box. But interesting to see Cooper finishes fourth. He loses more points than he really should have in that situation to Ferrandis and Forkner. So now Forkner moves to second in the championship, 10 points in it. He's got uh, the next round coming on Sunday and then the East-West Showdown uh, to make his case here. There's two rounds left. It's going to be chaos at that showdown, especially because Ferrandis isn't getting good starts. But interesting race, I would say. So first of all, let's talk about a couple things involved in this class. The heat race, the first heat race back after four months off, basically, for the West Coast guys was <laughs> flipping insane. First of all, Ferrandis leads early. Looked like he was riding pretty tight, stiff. Uh, David Villeman, his riding coach, even said that he looked like he was like puckering his butt the entire race. It was kind of a weird uh, anomaly there. But he's leading the race because he got a good start, which is also weird for Dylan Ferrandis. And then Cameron McAdoo ran him down and went to throw a fairly aggressive pass on him and put him down in a pretty similar fashion <laughs> that looked like it combined Christian Craig and Jet Lawrence's crash from Anaheim 2 together, where... Uh, McAdoo slid down the inside, slid his tires underneath Ferrandis's bike, so it flipped Ferrandis over, and he rode a nose wheelie, similar to what Jet Lawrence did after the whoops at A2, all the way into the triple face up here. And he was pretty darn fortunate to land on a bunch of tough blocks on the right-hand side of the track. Um, just an aggressive pass. McAdoo said he didn't mean to do it. Like, it just was, you know, he threw a pass in there. He thought he would be able to shut the line off before Ferrandis got on the gas to try to go up the triple, but it didn't happen that way. So Ferrandis had to kind of late back out of the challenge, and it really ended up being a lot worse than probably could have been. Um, but fans seemed to love it. I would have been really curious if fans had been in the stadium what the reaction would have been like, because obviously Ferrandis has been booed vehemently since uh, taking Craig out at Anaheim 2 and then pushed Forkner off the track twice, and people thought that was on purpose. So... Looking at comments on Instagram and Twitter from all these fans, it is just uh, we're <laughs> like, yeah, that's what you get for coming to our country and America, and that's payback for Craig and yada, 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 yada. So Supercross fans, everybody. But uh, Ferrandis is able to get up. He finished, I think, fifth in his heat or something like that. And then McAdoo, while still leading the race, got caught by Michael Moseman. And then in this corner that I'm coming up to right here, Moseman slid down the inside and like legitimately looked like he brake checked McAdoo and took them both down. <laughs> like 
just came to a dead stop in the corner. I don't know if he was trying to get into the rut or if he hooked things wrong or whatever, but they just came to a complete stop. McAdoo kind of rolled onto his back tire and then they both fell over. And it was kind of like a what are you guys doing kind of moment. Anyway, it allowed Christian Craig through. Craig took the win in his first race back since uh, fracturing his hand at Glendale. So just like in one heat race, you got the full gamut of everything. Like, hey, this is what you've been missing this entire time. Like the East Coast guys, they're ridiculous. They're, uh, they're awesome talents, no question. But the reality is, is that like this 250 West Coast is a little bit deeper. Not that uh, Sexton and McElrath are, you know, worse than the top tier riders in this West division, but you know, like they lapped all the way up to whatever was fourth in a main event one time. And you know, you're just really not going to see it with these West coast guys. I feel like you have guys like Alex Martin and uh, Michael Moseman finishing fifth and sixth. That's a lot, lot different than the guys that are finishing fifth and sixth on the East. In my opinion, like those are full fledged factory deals. And uh, those guys are kind of expected to win races and they're finishing fifth and sixth where uh, you're not really seeing that much on the East Coast, in my opinion. Anyway, 250 Heat 1 was ridiculous. 250 Heat 2 was a little less ridiculous, but still featured the, you know, patented Austin Forkner got a great start. Jet Lawrence was trying to outblitz the whoops on him for 16 years old. He is in full send mode in the whoops every lap, which is awesome for us fans but a little sketchy for him because he seems like when he gets out of shape in the whoops he has no idea what he's doing and he crashes often often in the whoops crashed twice in the whoops uh tonight or t you know last night whatever whenever you guys are watching this video but uh crashed in the heat race in the whoops at the very end of the whoops fortunately kind of got a little kick slid into the corner fell over then in the main event he also crashed in the whoops like five whoops in or something like that so yeah jet lawrence Really fast in the whoops, has great technique, but uh, as soon as things start going wrong, he seems to fold up a little bit, so hopefully he can get that kind of ironed out. Um, regardless, Lawrence Brothers, great duo to have in Supercross, and in practice, so I'm kind of going all over the place here, but in practice, uh, Hunter Lawrence in his Supercross debut was on a hot lap, he messed it up just a little bit, not so much that you would back out of the lap, so he continued the lap, but he messed up enough that Austin Forkner, who was only about like a second behind him, was suddenly right on him, and Forkner felt that he was blocked for the end of his lap, which was supposed to be a good hot lap. So they come over the finish line, jump, H-Law moves out of the way. I don't like that nickname, but I don't know. There's uh, not really a better nickname. People call him Hunter, but I just, you know, Hunter Lawrence, whatever. Kind of moved out of the way, and then... Uh, yeah, he like just was riding next to mechanics area, ripped a tear off, and then Forkner basically just turned across his nose, even clipped his front wheel just a little bit. And, uh, you know, you don't really mess with Australians like that. They always kind of fight back. <laughs> so Hunter Lawrence basically just came in and ruined Austin Forkner's day in the next corner. And he took himself out too, so a little bit of like an egregious pass attempt. Like should have probably went a little bit more with the not an abrupt angle or if he was going to go that abrupt maybe went in a little bit faster so he just blew off Forkner's front wheel and kept going himself anyway they both go down Forkner gets up and is like you know what the hell is that all about but you know getting mad at him and cutting him off and hitting his front wheel while he's trying to get out of your way is kind of poking the bear a little bit there and obviously like I said Australians don't take it from anybody so Hunter just comes back in and gives him the old heave ho there funny like good that neither of them got hurt so in the end it was kind of just like a funny interaction and Forkner even afterwards in the press conference talked about it and said like it's whatever like I can laugh about it now so no big deal but uh, yeah these West guys they're feisty man <laughs> they came back with a vengeance for this first round I'm really excited to see what happens uh, the next round on Sunday because these guys seem like they're not laying up whatsoever and I like that like I was talking about we're going to probably have two 250 championships come down to the East-West Showdown. It's only three points in it between uh, McElrath and Sexton. It's only ten points in it between Ferrandis and Forkner. And Cooper, I think, is only... He finished fourth. He must be 12 back of Ferrandis now or so. So he's still right in the mix. Like This is going to be really interesting down the stretch for both of these championships. And uh, I'm here for it. I'm excited for it. 
and uh, I think you guys should be too. I mean, why not? Why would you not want championship battles coming all the way down to the last lap in Vegas? Those ones are the best in my opinion, so hoping we get that. Uh, in that case, obviously, it means that uh, Forkner would probably need to win once again on Sunday. I don't think that's impossible because he gets great starts. He looks like he's in great form. Ferrandis is dealing with not good starts right now. And he actually talked about that in the press conference as well, where he said he, he thought his jump was pretty good. He came down the first corner pretty much with his teammate Cooper along his inside. But because he had a worse gate pick for finishing fifth in his heat race, he got pushed out in turn one because he's on the outside of everybody. And so it resulted in a much worse start because of that. Uh, so there's, I think, uh, Jet Lawrence, Justin Cooper, and Austin Forkner went like three by three into the first corner. And Frannis was outside of them, so he got pushed up the berm uh, in the first turn, and it resulted in him coming coming around the first turn in like 12th or so. So, again, I think his starts are fine. He's on a star Yamaha, and those things are great at elevation, so I think moving forward he'll probably be okay. But just something to keep an eye on because comparatively to Forkner, his starts are not good. They're not terrible all the way around because he's not coming around last every time. It's usually coming around 10th, but when Forkner's hole shotting and leading early and you have to catch him every time, not ideal, especially when you come into the final round, which is a showdown, and there's two other guys on opposite coast trying to win a championship for themselves. Pretty interesting. So we'll see uh, how that goes down the stretch. But anyway, that's just some thoughts and opinions to kind of surmise from round four in Salt Lake City, round 14 of the championship. West is back, 450s. Uh, we have split wins. Cooper Webb, his 10th win of his career. And uh, now it's gone Tomac Webb, Tomac Webb. So does that mean that Tomac is going to win on Sunday again? Who knows? Um, different track layout. They're changing it up completely from what we just saw. So uh, they went basically backwards from the track that was ran on Sunday, which uh, was kind of expected in the first place. But then they lucked out, I think, that they had ha had that plan in mind because the rain falling obviously made it so they couldn't move the track around them a bunch but uh now they're tearing the track down and rebuilding it again so yeah brand new track coming sunday we're gonna get back to racing and man these things are coming hot and heavy in quick succession i feel like i'm already just so burnt out but uh loving that supercross is back like i said so three more to go let's get excited about it and uh once again thanks again for stopping by listening to my ramblings and head down to the comment section below if you guys have anything you would like to add I'd be happy to comment back to what you guys are adding down below. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. So long for now.